Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Sloppy Lab. Uh, I'm JT Russell, and uh, with me tonight for his 3,457th act is Quick Draw. <laughs> Quick Draw, three, four, five, seven. <laughs> How are we doing tonight, Quick Draw? How's it going? I'm doing good. Good to be back. We took a. I took a week off. I don't know about you. I mean, you never take a week off, Justin. Never taking weeks off. Never taking weeks off. Um, but yeah, not to be outdone and very fitting for our second episode of season two. That's two, two right there. Not tonight's listening, I'm sure. Uh, we have none other than second act. Very fitting indeed. Welcome back to the lab, second act. Thanks, but I guess I now need 3,455 more acts. <laughs> You'll catch up. You'll catch up one day. Okay. <laughs> you will catch up. Oh, man. That's a lot of that's a lot of seasons. Holy moly. Holy moly. Well, it would be it would be a cool thing. Cool problem to have for the rest of the Keyforge community. <laughs> How do we get rid of these sloppy lab work guys? <laughs> exactly. Exactly and, my thoughts. Oh, like, or, or weekend key warriors, I suppose. Yeah, that's a lot of acts. Um, and welcome to the folks in the chat. Hello, Cloggin, Fluxamall, Dataforce Stream. Welcome, welcome. Glad to have you all here with us tonight uh, or today or whatever whatever it happens to be where you're at. Um, yeah, we have a super fun topic. This is actually one that, uh, John, that you uh, you kind of pitched or, or thought would be fun to talk about when we were in our interludes. Uh, so the topic, uh, if I'm uh, paraphrasing correctly, is how to win an Archon, how to win an Archon. and uh, do you want to uh, just kind of tee up how how the you know the genesis of this and and what made you think it'd be kind of fun to dig into? Yeah, absolutely. So I've talked about this a little bit before on my podcast on Weekend Key Warriors, but I wanted to go into it in a lot more detail here. Um, the idea that I hear in a lot of places that I can't compete in Archon because I don't have a deck that's competitive enough to win an Archon, and to me, my experience has shown that you don't necessarily have to have, you know, one of the established big money decks in order to be able to compete in Archon. So just as an example, um, the very first Keyforge Voltor I ever went to, um, I took a deck that I had bought for $35 on eBay. It was called Duke H Gaunt Vision, and it ran all the way to second place in that tournament. And you might say, well, how did that happen? And a lot of the reason why that happened was because it was an unsettled meta at that time. Worlds Collide had just come out. People didn't know how to deal with a lot of the Worlds Collide stuff yet. Everyone was still sitting on their old um, Coda stuff. And so it was able to sneak in in a way that um, might not have been possible if it had been three months earlier or three months later. Of course, three months later was COVID, so it definitely would have been possible. But, um, and then uh, at Nationals this year, I was able to run an archetype. Everyone was talking about how the woe decks that you wanted to play were prospector decks or berserker decks, and most of the other tokens weren't super useful. Although I guess some people were saying warriors. But what I was able to do was run a legionary scholar deck, which now everyone looks at and everyone says, hey, that's a really strong combo. <laughs> but at the time, it was a relatively new thing into the meta. And again, an unsettled meta let me sneak in with something that might not necessarily have been what everyone else was looking at or what everyone else was trying to play at that point. So I think that there are ways that you can be competitive without having to go out and spend hundreds of dollars on a deck if you can find those holes in the meta and exploit those holes in the meta. Mm -hmm. and All right. Yeah, just before we go on to, I have I have second act who lionizes helium. The deck you're talking about, uh, pull up on screen for the folks on uh, on Twitch with us while we're doing this live. Looking at it, saying that oh, but this is an 86 SAS deck. Must be nice to be you. Uh, I have preview SAS enabled. Let me let me flop over to current SAS, where we'll see that this is currently weighing in at 74. 74. And I believe too that that bump is largely in part to you representing this deck so well at the event, uh, facing <laughs> off against uh, facing off against uh, Nova and and having her say, okay, maybe maybe some of this stuff deserves a little bit more weight. <laughs> yeah, Nova did actually tell me after um, we played at Nationals that a large reason why Legionary and scholars got a huge bump there was because of what that deck was able to do to jock at um yeah during the uh, original rounds there hmm. 
And okay, side side note, because we care a lot about pronunciation on the show. Do you say Jock, J- Jock or Jacques? J- and I've heard Jack too. Well, technically, I guess it should be Jacques, but um, I usually just say it quick and say Jock. So okay, mm. all right, all right, oh, okay. Noted, 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 and moving on. <laughs> so, um, I I have some initial questions. So, mm-hmm. I hear you, and I I think this is a very relatable topic, and I think that a lot of people listening, myself included, are very eager to learn more from you about this. Now, my first rebuttal is going to be sort of what Justin JT already hinted at here is that second act who ionizes helium is currently an eighty six SAS deck in the future SAS. I just looked up uh, Duke, was it Gaunt, Gaunt Vision? It's an 83 SAS, which you got for $35 in a, in a nice deal on eBay. So it sounds like, you know, you're talking about a meta that was unsettled, but we're kind of in a settled meta now. Or like, let's assume that like most of the time we are in a more settled meta. There might be like one big event where you're not. And so I think no one would look at Duke Gaunt Vision now as I'm looking at this deck with Triple Tribute, Brachus, Ludo, two Pumpitis. Um, it actually has a, a decent amount of C for a World Collide deck. Like, no one would look at this and say, like, oh, this is a very unassuming deck. I wonder if I can win a Voltor with this. You'd look at this and be like, yeah, this could, this is a pretty, pretty powerful deck, um, especially for back in that time period. So, like, try to help me get to the point where I, I can say like, all right, you know what? I probably have a deck in my 500 that I own that I could win with. Cause right now I don't feel like I have that. And I, I'm pretty fortunate to have a good collection, a big collection, some fairly good decks. I still can't find that confidence when I'm looking at things like Jacques or ooze or even a uh, second act with, I'm going to refer to the deck by its <laughs> first name. Um, and <laughs> And another example is one of our teammates decks, JDG, um, Chandra, the Probably Complex. That deck, deck is insane. And so, like, I was actually playing against him in Kagi last season or two seasons ago, and I knew that he was going to bring that deck because he always plays that deck. And I just was killing myself trying to figure out what deck can I even bring that can win against this in Adaptive. And I was having trouble finding something. So, like, I look at the caliber of these decks that are getting to be pretty famous now, and I just, I'm struggling to think that I have a deck that can compete. So like, how would you convince me otherwise? Well, the first thing I would say that you would want to do is you want to play your decks or at least your good decks um, against each other. That's what I did when I got all of my woe decks in is I immediately started playing them against each other and kind of seeing what stood, which one went to the top. And Helium was definitely the one that went to the top. Sorry for calling it by its last name, but that's how I refer to it. Um, <laughs> So Helium was definitely the deck that went to the top when I did that. And so at that point, um, I started testing it against a lot of the well-known decks out there. Now, at the time, Ooze wasn't the thing yet, um, or maybe it had just shown up in Philadelphia or something like that, but it wasn't really a major part of the meta yet. Um, However, a lot of the other decks like Pink Jacket and Pink Fraud and Jock, those were all known decks. So I tested it against those decks. Now, the way I did that was because I take my junk decks that I'm not using for anything, and I take those decks and I make um, uh, proxy decks with them. Mm -hmm. And those proxy decks give me a chance to you know get practice playing real life games now of course you can also go on tco and practice against those and i guess that works just as well or it's even better if you can get your teammates if you have teammates to um, play those decks against you but however you're going to do it you want to practice against those decks and what i found when i was practicing helium against those decks was that helium had a very good matchup into jock and i knew that going into nationals when i went into that matchup anybody else i guess would have been really nervous to face jock i was very happy to face jock because i felt like i had a good matchup in there um i knew that it had a somewhat favorable matchup into pink jacket i had won that matchup a few times in practices um it had about a 50 50 matchup against pink fraud so when i practiced all that and I played all those um, matches out, I was able to notice that it had a good chance against those very well-known decks. 
So I think that's a big part of it is just practicing and playing those games. Now, as far as the unsettled meta thing that I was talking about earlier, uh, one of the things that was really advantageous for me the first time that I faced Jock was that Nova, I don't think, had seen a legionary um, trainer scholar deck before, at least not one like that, and didn't necessarily know exactly how to attack it at that point. Mm -hmm. So I think that was something that uh, also worked out advantageously. Interesting. So you're doing very, very intentional testing against the top decks that you're expecting to see at uh, at a Voltor or at Nationals or what have you. You know, do you, you have your kind of gauntlet i mean i i know but i'm asking for for the folks for the folks at home right you have a gaunt, your gauntlet of uh of top decks already proxied up and that you kind of run through and that's that's kind of a regular thing yeah that's how i <laughs> do a lot of my testing is by running against those top decks and i don't necessarily need the deck to beat every top deck mm -hmm. because there if if a deck wins every against every top deck consistently, then I mean, it's probably the best deck in Keyforge. And I don't think I have the best deck in Keyforge in my collection. Well, I, and I don't think the best deck in Keyforge, the quote unquote best deck in Keyforge beats every every deck consistently, right? I, I, I hope, I don't believe that there is such a deck, um, but I think it's an important point too, because I, I, I believe that a lot of folks jam a bunch of games on TCO's competitive queue and say, oh, this is my highest win rate deck against the randos on on competitive it's got to be my best deck my best shot for a vault tour which i don't think is necessarily true either i mean in a number of cases it will be um but i don't think it's you know necessarily uh necessarily for me or, or any of the vote or any of the folks like do you care about i think that's yeah, yeah go, go ahead i was go gonna ahead. say i think that type of testing is worthwhile mm -hmm. and the reason i think that type of testing is worthwhile is because when you go to a vault tour every deck you play isn't ooze or jock yep. or pink fraud or any of those decks um you're going to play a lot of other decks too and you got to make sure that you don't just match up well into the top decks but that you match up well into the other random decks that you're likely to see there uh, and that also helps you learn what are your weak matchups? What are the types of things that are going to cause problems for your deck? Um, I was very lucky um, at Nationals because I ended up in round three, I guess it was, four, I don't remember, but against one of my weak matchups. And I got very lucky in um, a couple of ways there, which is that number one, my deck drew out very well. And number two, my opponent made mistakes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just need those sorts of things to break right for you. You know, you're never going to be able to get to top eight in a vault or without some things breaking right. Yeah. Um, I, well, I, I guess maybe if you're Nova on Jock, then yes, you can. But beyond that. <laughs> I mean, it's it's fair. I think there's I mean there's there's value in volume of experience. Right? There's value and volume of experience, and that doesn't have to be necessarily against the top competition. And there's also value in kind of uh, kind of quality. Let's let's say the the, qual the quality versus the quantity. Right? Tar very targeted. Um, and I mean, when we were talking to JDG before Canadian Nationals, it was you know, do I take the deck that probably beats um, that probably beats Pink Fraud or has a good matchup against Pink Fraud, or I take the deck that probably beats every other deck in the room or has a better chance against every other deck in the room. And if I make it to the finals, ho-hum against pink, pink, uh, pink fraud, uh, I'll just hope for some luck, you know, it's an interesting question. I don't know. Um, but maybe he's wishing now with a second place trophy that he went the other way. <laughs> but I mean, who knows that he gets that second place trophy at that point. Right. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Right. Um, so it probably doesn't probably doesn't. Um, this is kind of like, leads me to a question that I had asked JT and some of the other Slappy Lab workers recently. It was like, at what point, like we talked last year, last season about um, the meta and what is a Keyforge meta. And I stated back then that I didn't really think that there was really a meta because there was such a diverse range of decks that could win. And I think that's what you're saying as well. But then on the other hand, we see very consistent performers like Jacques. And at what point do you say like, okay, the deck I'm bringing to Archon in this tournament has to be able to beat Jacques or I'm not bringing it. Like that is really a meta game at that point where you say like, eh, Jacques is the meta because I'm if I'm going to win, I'm probably going to have to face it. And so this deck loses to it, even though it might be my best deck otherwise. 
Like, does that get into your head at all? Well, I think back to um, what didn't happen, but what very easily could have happened um, at Nationals, because at Nationals, um, Corey, um, Vermont Gamer, uh, was in the other semifinal match, and he was able to win the other semifinal match, and then he knew that his matchup into Jock was a bad matchup. So he's sitting there hoping that I could knock Jock off, which I did not manage to do. The deck didn't draw off very, draw out very well, unfortunately, in that round. Um, but had I managed to do that, he wouldn't have had to face Jock at all. So sometimes, again, that comes down to, you know, much like the question about um, JDG and his um, decision he had to make. Do you decide to take your deck that's going to go well against most of everything and then just hope that you um, can get some luck regarding these top decks? And I think that's kind of what you have to do in that case. You don't want to bring a deck specifically to defeat one deck because mm -hmm. you're going to generally, if you, if you have that silver bullet, it's got to be able to get to that matchup in the first place, and it's probably not going to. Yeah. So I, mean, I think you hope for some luck. You hope somebody else does your job for you. This was a big thing. Uh, I mean, a bigger thing in the days of MTG Grand Prix where you'd get buys based on your ELO rating. This is back in the days before they did points and had an ELO rating, you know, and you could bring a different deck with three buys, right? Because you missed a whole lot of random junk in the first three rounds that could just throw you off. And I think there's there's sort of stages to a large event there is the like I, I i need to be able to just punch really hard and wade through kind of random stuff and then there's like i'm gonna whittle down to where things are more well defined and then there's the like top eight phase where you probably have a decent sense for the the strength of the deck or even even type of the deck that you're going to be facing and it's almost like almost different different pulls for each of those each of those phases which is which is really interesting yeah, lots of lots of rogue stuff, especially in the early phases. No. So I don't know. Or of course you you could do what I managed to do with the first two tournaments of this year and face Zach Armstrong in first round at your first tournament and then face George Cago in first round at your second tournament. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. That's how the draw is sometimes. It happens. That's how the draw is. Uh, um, before we go on, this like it's really weighing into my my thinking for we, quick draw and I, we are, we're heading to KFC in a few weeks, some weeks, four, uh, some number of weeks. Um, three, yeah, four. Three, thereabouts. Um, but the deck that I w that I played at the last Voltor um, is a very strong deck. Mm, I, I, I would want to say maybe my best deck, um, but uh, it's very reactive. And I think having something that, having a proactive strategy really helps you punch through those for early rounds especially um and i think yeah uh, i don't know that's that's something that's kind of weighing in my mind and i think it's probably something that is something you should consider when you're thinking you know how to win out how, how to win in archon right you have to i think having a, a proactive strategy having threats is very strong like is very good uh, especially for the early rounds and it's uh and especially if you're thinking about getting through you know, five to eight rounds versus punching through one round, like uh, like you're like an ABR a week uh, deck selection versus uh, versus a, a hoping to make day two of a vault tour sort of a sort of a scenario. I think you're exactly right, and I think that um, just in general, I'm a reactive player by nature. I like having responses to things. I like having mm -hmm. artifact control. I like having board sweeps. I like having amber control. I like, if you present a threat, I have something I can do about it. But what I've discovered is that in general, those decks have not done very well for me. Mm -hmm. The decks that have done very well for me are the decks that are presenting their own threats. The decks that are saying, you must answer this or you're in trouble. Yeah, not tonight. Is um, vigorously nodding think, your head somewhere. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that if you look at the um, Vegas Vault Tour and you look at the Archon Top Eight, there was one piece of kind of semi-hard R in the entire Top Eight. Uh, that was uh, that Equidon card that lets you swap your artifact for somebody else's artifact. I don't remember what it's called. Uncommon currency uncommon is that currency. the one? Yeah, that's yep. it. Yeah. Yeah. So there was one uncommon currency, and that was the entire artifact control in the entire top eight. 
So I think there's two potential conclusions you can draw there. I think one potential conclusion you can draw there is that in general right now, the meta is not leaning towards those sorts of decks. So you should probably play something that doesn't do that, something that is just going to present its own threats and not worry about having responses to things. You could also look at it that if you can find a deck that has responses to things, it could do really, really well in the current meta if you can also if you can respond to those specific decks, if you can do things that neutralize what those decks are trying to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and the deck I want to bring up here, and I think you have this one ready to go, uh, Justin, which is Faith B Troptogram. Yep, yep. Sith's deck from uh, yeah, this is previous Voltor. Sith of Angmar's deck that he used to win. Wait, it was Dallas, is that right? And the thing I find so interesting about this, yeah, so I believe he won Dallas with it. Uh, and the thing I find so interesting about this deck is that, as Z has said several times about this deck, it's not a strange shell deck, it's a sandhopper deck. Uh, and the whole deck is the triple sandhopper. And I think he's largely correct about that. And so when I look at this deck, I see, okay, so it wins against a lot of decks, but one Snecklifter completely tears this deck apart because you Snecklifter the Sandhopper, you Sandhopper the Snecklifter, um, bring it back down, grab the second um, Sandhopper, bring it back down, grab the third Sandhopper, bring it back down, grab the Equisi Outpost or something else, and suddenly all the artifacts are on your side of the board and you probably win the game pretty easily. So if you face that deck and you happen to have the correct R, that's going to make for a really good matchup there. So it, you could make the argument that if you could find the right deck that has hard R and can match up relatively well into some of these decks, you could steal a bunch of games that way. But so far, that isn't really the way that it's been working out. Those decks have not been making it through to the top eights. Mm. And being like the snack lifter decks. <clears throat> Yeah, and I mean the the flip side of that too is you know the, the silver bullets get spread very thin, right? Like like it was Snick, it was Snecklifter for Faith, but you know it's a different card for a different monster deck. Uh, so the if your if your if your hopes are on Snecklifter, you know maybe you you play Faith once, um, but maybe that's not enough to carry you to a top cut. Whereas whereas Faith has to dodge the one or two Snecklifter decks in the field. Um, so so it's interesting. I mean, this is this is this actually is a point that's very interesting to me. You see a lot of decks that are very good when their artifact hits. You know the artifact, quote unquote artifact decks, right? So there's there's this one with triple triple sandhopper. You know, heart of the forest is the one that everybody talks about, um, though no one seems to be really playing, <laughs> at least outside of alliance. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, I play, I play a, a very artifact heavy deck, and I'm, it's the first thing I look for is do they have a hard hard R? And it's a very different game if the answer is yes than if it's no. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, John, you've said to me many times that you really only consider decks with hard R. So, given what you said about some of these recent results, is that is that still true for you? Yes, um, I still look for decks with hard R because there are so many auto losses you can take if you don't have hard R. Um, Etten's Jar, of course, is the top um, card that comes to mind. But I look at um, some what we've seen in some of the previews for um, Grim Reminders so far and the curse cards that are coming out and some of the other cards we've seen there. And I look at some of the really powerful artifacts like Sandhopper that are in Winds of Exchange. Oh, and for me, like I look at a deck like Helium, and in Helium, one Serarium completely shuts it down. So having the destroy them all in there is absolutely essential for that deck because otherwise it just completely dies. Yeah, I've, I've had some decks that I would have liked to play and then I, I avoided solely because of something like Eaton's Jar, which is, I think, definitely like a more meta card than Serarium. Like, you're more likely, I think, to run into Eaton's Jar in a Vault Tour than you are Serarium just because of the the strength in them. You know, like, people want to play Mm -hmm. Eaton's Jar decks. Um, And so I think you're kind of saying that, yeah, like, that's a valid 
And so that's that's why it's important to you to have something like a destroy them all in there. If you did not have that, would you still feel comfortable playing helium? If it was like just destroy them all was out and you had no hard R in there. Um, that's a really good question. I would say that I probably would still have played the deck, but I would have been much less comfortable um, with the deck and would have been a lot more nervous about it. But that said, I don't know that I've ever actually run into a situation where I desperately needed the destroy them all in order to get out of a um, mess like that. And again, be probably because of what you're saying about Serrarium not showing up all that often. Or, um, you know, I have run into an Etten's jar before with it, but um, I think they jarred the destroy them all. So if the destroy them all hadn't been there, then they probably would have been able to jar something else like, of course, the trainers, and that would have caused a real a large problem for the deck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is so this is interesting. I push this one step farther. Uh, uh, good chat. A uh, good comment from the chat that hard R is a scam and it's a luxury for the already rich, right? So the question is like, dig, you know, the next question below that is like, okay, let's suppose you don't have a, a very deep collection or you're not trying to break the bank seeking out a top tier deck. You know, at what point are you like, no, this deck is just you know, the, the, your, your decks are on a, on a scale, right? From from best to worst. And your best decks don't have any R, hard R, but you go down kind of a level or two and you, and you start seeing the hard R showing up. Like at what point are you like, mm, this deck is good enough relative to my other options that I should just play it instead of the hard R? Is there kind of like a cutoff in your mind? For me, the wanting hard r comes much more from purchasing decks than it does from playing decks from my own collection if i open a deck and it's really good and it doesn't have hard r i'll play it mm -hmm. now but if i'm going to purchase a deck if i'm going to spend money on a deck i want to have hard r in there that's fair i feel the same way usually that's yeah fair. and i think that's partly psychological but yeah it makes sense to me What's the, ooh, another question? Oh, man, the chat is on fire. What's the value of hard R in the double sided artifacts discussion? Get out of here with your hard R. We're saying if your opponent plays a whirlpool and you blow it up, you are not welcome to the sloppy lab. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to be disconnecting and not returning. Um, I'm going to say my, my recollection is that when Quick Draw and I played in last AVR, he played down a whirlpool, and the first thing I did was blow it up. Yeah, I know. Everyone always does that because they they recognize that it's probably the most powerful card in the game, so Actually, they have to just drop what they're doing and destroy it. This one, this one is for this one's for you, Cloggin. You can kill all the artifacts you like, but it has to be with a fight after you've animated it. Okay, no auction offs. You know, no reclaims. You got to animate it and fight it down. Then, then it's good. Then it's good. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> in some ways, Animator is the best hard R in the game. Just can keep destroying things over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. Animator is great. Animator is great. That is the only piece of R in uh, in T Zyger. Not not Zygler, but Z Zyger. Um, that uh, <laughs> uh, that's probably the, that's the deck that I would be playing if not for a recent open, uh, probably at KFC. But all it has is the all it has is the Animator and Ultra Gravitron to subsequently purge that artifact for goods. For goodsies. Nice. Um, but yeah. Um, I want to back up a little bit. Um, and so, John, you had mentioned a few times the factor of, of luck in an Archon tournament. Mm -hmm. And so for uh, another season one callback to when we talked about luck, skill, and deck, what would you rate luck, skill, and deck uh, on a scale of, you know, 100 points to give out? How would you divide that up? Not to put you on the spot. So my issue is that when you get to very high level play like you would see in the later stages of a vault tour skill doesn't tend to matter as much at that point because everybody is very skilled everybody's playing very well people aren't making mistakes now yes there are some players nova's one of them george kegel's another one um who might be just that extra level above because they can really see the whole big picture and see everything that's going on. But for the most part, I don't think skill makes a major difference at that point. I think the biggest factor at that point becomes the deck matchup and then things like draw luck become the second biggest factor. I think skill becomes very much a wash at the top level. 
So, Interesting. Yeah, just just to clarify though, you're not saying that skill doesn't matter. You're saying that once you've gotten to that point, it's almost a given. It's almost a given. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So to get yes, to that absolutely. point, when I yeah, to get to that point, it's very helpful. Um, I have definitely had um, instances in several tournaments I've played in this year where I should have lost games and I won those games because of opponent mistakes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just really need to get that. I don't know if you would even call that a matter of luck. I mean, that really goes under skill, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But sometimes you need to be saved from luck by skill, I guess. But usually that only happens in the early rounds because typically if you're making those sorts of mistakes, you're not playing in the later rounds. Mm -hmm. Hmm. No, that's fair. That's fair. And so, I, yeah, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say so far, your takeaways here that you're trying to, you know, share with the audience is that you don't need the best deck. You don't need a top tier deck, but if you have some skill and to get out of the early rounds, you have a deck that you prefer a, a proactive deck that, creates threats for the opponent um and you like something that um i don't want to say well-rounded but you know is at least like you know it doesn't have a bunch of duds in it because if you have a bunch of dead cards then you know you're gonna lose a lot of your punch so what else uh and what the, else would you would you add to that yeah and the other thing i would definitely throw in there is the idea of making sure that you test the deck and not only that, but that you get a lot of reps with the deck beforehand. Now, I know there's a couple instances this year where people have opened a deck on the Friday of a vault tour and then gone on and been successful with it in Archon. And that will happen on occasion. Sometimes you just get the right deck with the right matchups and the right luck and everything falls into place and you do very well that way. But in general, I think that you are better off having a bunch of plays um, on your deck. Uh, I think that if you look at a lot of the decks that are winning Vault Tours this year, um, for example, um, June's deck, uh, Becky, um, she had, what, a thousand plays on it or something like that. Um, Nova's got to have 500 plays on Jock or somewhere around there. So having a lot of plays on a deck and having seen it in a lot of situations can be very helpful. I generally won't play a deck at a major tournament unless I've got at least a hundred reps on it. Now, obviously that's going to um, depend upon the amount of time that you have and no one, and not everyone's going to be able to get to that level, but you're going to want to put as many reps into the deck as you um, can beforehand, partially because it lets you know, when you have to shift your strategy. Like one of the things that Nova has been fantastic at doing on Jock is she knows what type of strategy she's going to have to play for that particular game. Is she going to play a lot of the Dis and Infernus and try and purge out a lot of her opponent's um, cards and threats? Is she going to try and get down the Saurians and just try and hold the board? She has different options for the way that she can play that deck. And she knows which one of those options she's going to pursue for a particular game. So having that sort of flexibility and knowing when to use that sort of flexibility is, I think, another really important factor there. And experience gets you that. I definitely envy that deck's flexibility. Like, I've, I've noticed it as well. Like, not every deck has that flexibility, though. Like, if you, if you have a deck with lots of archiving decisions, lots of purging decisions, especially self-purging, that's when you get to a deck that can play two completely different games. And not every Archon deck can do that. But in that example, I, I totally agree that, you know, having those extra reps will teach you these situations to understand better which line of attack you need to be going in a matchup. Yeah, one of my um, WoW decks that um, I've played a fair bit in Archon at this point is an interesting deck because it has a really good Equidon house and it has a really good Brobnar house with a subpar Star Alliance house. And that subpar Star Alliance house has a Quixel stone in it. And that Quixel stone is really interesting because every game you have to make the decision of, am I going to play that Quixel stone or am I going to discard that Quixel stone? And the deck obviously is a completely different deck if you play the Quixel stone versus if you discard the Quixel stone. But I've won a lot of games by playing that Quixel Stone, even though it's a Halifest deck and it wants to hold a board, I've won by playing that Quixel Stone and 
neutralizing what my opponent's trying to do. And I've won also by not playing the Quixel Stone and playing to the deck's strengths in Brobnar and Equidon. So oftentimes, knowing that, knowing how f to approach the flexibility of your deck is a really important skill. And the only way you'll learn that, especially in a matchup in a situation like that, where your decision is based less on your own deck and more on your opponent's deck, is by playing the deck against a lot of different matchups and seeing what happens. And also experimenting, right? Um, sometimes you just have to take a shot and try a line that you haven't played in the deck before. Yeah. Uh, JT, I see you do that all the time, playing some of your decks. It's really fascinating to like, you're going into play a competitive queue just against someone random or maybe against a teammate. And um, it's you have a great deck, a tier one deck, and then you just like kind of mess around and like try to do something different that you hadn't done before just to see if it works. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great practice strategy. Um, and then kind of give someone playing against it like false hope, <laughs> like, oh man, like I just I just beat this amazing deck. And it's like, well, like JT was just kind of messing around over there, you know? Trying yeah. something new, but it's it's good practice though. It's a it's a great line of thinking to try to see like, can I do something maybe that I didn't expect that I could do with that? Yeah, the f forced exploration. You, you have to be very uh very kind of intentional with your exploration for some decks, and it's easy to like to pick up a deck that you love and you've played a lot, and just kind of get into a rut with how you how the lines play out, and like, oh, I have this one line that looks that I love that I love doing. It's a lot of fun to play, and you just push for that push for that every time. Um, the deck that I have pulled up now uh t zager the lighthouse stock mentioned a couple times has a really fun line where you you know you've got animator and transporter platform and then you're playing um you're playing uh ultra gravitron every turn and it's like lols look my archive is huge um and that's awesome but it takes a lot of time to set up it's it it is almost certainly winning when it's when it lines up you know it's very hard to to win when a deck is you know, archiving five a turn, maybe purging one of your dudes and, and capturing onto its own artifacts, just kind of kind of silly. Um, but, you know, if you set that aside, there's an ignore kind of the Gravitron shenanigans, there's still a pretty good deck there with, you know, Infernuses and, and Kirby's and like, man, maybe you could just play this as an MM value deck and, uh, and that's just good enough. So I'll play a lot of games where I ignore the like really kind of strong, good lines that I've already established and just see what how the deck behaves when I'm trying to push it in other directions. And I think that's a really important kind of approach. And on the other end of the spectrum, like T Zager is, is an excellent deck. It was probably one of my best one of my best pulls next to one or two others. Um, uh, but I have another deck that I'm playing in, in Kagi right now and I'm on my I'm four matches in. I've not played the deck the same way in any of the four games and what's really interesting too is i don't think any of my opponents have played it the same in any game either and it just kind of goes to show you like how deep a lot of these decks can be and how much there is to explore with some of them and if you if you do just take the lines that you're comfortable with or that you've that you fell in love with the first time they could be great lines but if you don't force yourself to kind of try some of the other ones you're you're very possibly leaving a lot of value on the table and that does mean probably losing horribly in some games <laughs> you know uh uh i mean I've, I've had games where quick draws come has come in and i've just got like 20 strange shells on the board and i'm not making any amber and he's like what? i remember that game he's like what the hell are you doing like i'm just seeing what happens i, I, I messaged you like uh <laughs> you're not this bad when you play against me on tuesday evening so what's going on over here uh but then I, you i i understood later that you know that's that's your way of doing the forced exploration which i think is great yeah yeah and I, th I think there are a lot of decks in the in this you know 70 to 75 range that can cough up a lot of value if you kind of plumb the depths of what they're capable of um like uh i'm gonna i'm gonna bring up again the deck that i'm playing in kagi right now like has a lot of self-purging tools right yeah uh, it's got buzzle it's got it's got a lot of archiving that you can and you can just kind of stash things away to, to craft your deck and it's like, well, like, how does my deck operate when I've carved it, carved it down to like this 20 card configuration or like this 18 card configuration? Um, all of a sudden, I'm playing with I'm playing with a deck that feels more like a much higher rated deck because I'm I'm pound for pound with what remains, just much better. And uh, and those sorts of decks are very interesting. Jacques is the perfect example, right? Because you're you're essentially crafting the deck that you want for each particular matchup, but uh, it doesn't take much to, to turn that on, you know, maybe a, a buzzle and some archiving. 
um, and you can really, really do a lot with those sorts of decks. Um, I will say too that uh, Fudgenator just brought up a really good point in the chat. Um, he said, so, seeing someone else play your deck is a great way to learn new things about your deck. Absolutely. And I think that's a really important um, thing to do is to either play adaptive or some other um, exchange type of uh, format or just, you know, play with teammates and have them run your deck and let's and see what they decide to do with it. And they may play lines that you never saw in it. Yeah, I love that as well. I think it's fantastic. And um, I, I want to do that more, you know, like I, I totally agree with that point. It's a great way to learn a deck is to watch someone else play with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not, not tonight. And I so do hand and else... a decent amount as well when we're, when we're learning decks and it's, you'd, you'd think, you'd think that two people who play a lot, you know, I, I pretend to be decent sometime. I, I don't know if I've convinced some people or not, probably not, but there's, <laughs> It's like we would have chosen different houses or played a turn completely differently, uh, and and exploring those, uh, like talking through those decisions with with your teammates, is like invaluable, invaluable, and a great way to hone in on, you know, where you can eke extra value out of out of the decks that are your Archon contenders. Yeah. So another thing I wanted to kind of talk about is the idea of consistency in a deck. There's certainly decks that you're going to find that are high roll decks and, you know, maybe one out of every three games, they will just go off. And when they do, it's basically impossible to stop it. And it's probably an auto win at that point. A lot of Jenka decks are like that, right? Uh, and there's a lot of other combo decks that work that same way. But I think that you need to have a certain degree of consistency and repeatability to the deck, whatever it's its key thing is it needs to be able to consistently do it game after game or at least in the vast majority of games in order to make sure that you are going to get to a vault tour and you are going to be reasonably confident that your deck is going to do what it needs to do because if you want to get to you know a top eight at a vault tour you're going to have to probably win depending upon the size of the vault tour you're probably going to have to win half a dozen games to get there or pretty close to it and so in order to win that many games you're going to need to have your deck consistently performing and the fact that your deck can explode and you know beat a really good deck like pink fraud or whatever doesn't necessarily mean that it's good enough to be consistent and beat everything it needs to beat along the way to get there. So I think that that consistency piece is another thing you're looking for when you're testing a deck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can totally relate to this one too. Um, in fact, the first thing that I thought of when you mentioned this was uh, the deck I played in the Philadelphia Voltor VCK. And uh, if you want to pull that one up, it's got a lot of duplicates. And so when I think of consistency, one of the things that I look for is redundancy in the cards. So it has mm -hmm. two red alerts, two unnatural selection, two nature's call, two chain gang, two subtle chain. Like everything is kind of, it's consistent in what it's doing. And that allows it to be pretty consistent for me, like game after game. It has a few situations where it can have bad draws, but the bad draws are pretty rare with this one because there's so many duplicates, um, two lay of the land as well, two encounter suit. It's got so many doubles. Um, that it just really enables you to have that consistent game plan that you're pretty confident that you can execute. So um, this is the one that I would probably be bringing. And uh, I, I did pretty well with it in Philadelphia. It wasn't quite good enough. Um, but, you know, I, I still like, I still second guess, you know, like, is this good enough to keep up with a lot of the other stuff we've talked about tonight? Mm. Quick draw. You, you just discard all your cards every turn. I mean, doesn't get more consistent than that. <laughs> uh, we we love discarding cards. I mean, it's, it's what the, the the team was named after discarding cards. I mean, yeah, and I mean, I I joke, but uh, I was standing behind you for a number of games, uh, especially in the latter rounds, um, as you were as you were playing and, and the matches were dwindling down, and just just very impressed with some of the decision making and how you were able to kind of make your, I don't know, make your own consistency, if you will, if that makes sense. Um, 
yeah i discarded some cards that i think people wouldn't think to discard um and it's just that's like you mentioned earlier john like the reps you get the reps and you understand what your deck's trying to do you understand when your deck gets in the way of itself and one of the cards that gets in the way of itself in here is the explorer over I, i've lost some games because i played explorer over either as a creature or as an upgrade because sometimes i want to kill my own creatures you know, I want to have an empty board for the trust no ones, which there's also two of those, the duplicates. Um, you want to have fewer creatures for red alert. Um, so discarding things like that um, and just trying to keep your board empty can really make a big difference. And so I, I think it's often creatures that I'm discarding in this deck that people will be like, yeah, why wouldn't you just play the spears? You know, like, it, what, what could it hurt, right? And then you set up like a bigger trust no one the next turn after that. So like, Th that is more aligned with like the reps and understanding your decks matchups and, and what your goals are. Mm. Not to mention with the Expo <laughs> Rover, um, I'd be terrified of Mark of Dis too. Yeah. Also, yeah. yeah. Mark of Dis is a card that I learned to play around with this deck pretty quickly. Um, any three power creature uh, in Untamed is an automatic discard if I'm playing against Mark of Dis because Mark of Dis will, could end some games against you. Yeah. And I. Mm -hmm. A, an interesting interesting prompt from from the chat you know from clog and how how do these kind of skills map to other things i mean w without going too far afield this this reminds me a lot of studying say studying openings in in chess right it's very easy to memorize some moves but unless you're understanding the ideas behind the moves uh it's very easy to, to either get yourself get yourself trapped or backed into a corner or go down a path subsequently or even get to a point where you're like now what um and understanding like like when i'm sitting behind you quick draw and you discard spears it's and i'm just like why the heck would you discard spears it's like such a valuable <laughs> it's like such a good card and then two turns later three turns later it's like double trust no one like all right this man this man knows what's what's going on i mean those played reps, a few games played a few games but you've also built up the intuition and you under and you have you understand the principles uh behind the earlier decision making right it's not like yeah. uh yeah yeah spears is funny in here because everyone thinks spears is a great card i almost never get any value out of spears and it's for two reasons one is she's a witch and they always want to kill her second is there's not a ton of cards i want to discard mm. like there might be a few star alliance cards that i could discard but if i'm doing that that means i'm most likely doing it in house which is kind of yeah not much value in there you could discard stuff with ghost hawk but like most of the un uh, untamed stuff has pips so like i'm not excited to discard those um the shadows has a couple cards that i wouldn't mind discarding but like yeah, for the most part the spears doesn't you know it's not like the kind of card that people like fear normally in, in this deck as it is in other decks um and counter suits another thing like i sometimes i put in counter suit on spears just to make them fight twice because I, I don't even care if it dies. I just like want to take them out, you know, like make them do something a little bit different to go out of their way. Even though I like I don't want it to survive, I don't care, you know. Um, so there's kind of interesting things like you know, playing into your opponent maybe a little bit. Um, but you get further and further into day one, or if you are lucky enough to make it to day two, those kind of tricks aren't always going to work. Once you get to that point where you were talking about earlier, that skill matters less because everyone's going to make the right calls. Or is less of a less of a differentiator. Let's say let's not say matters yeah. less. I don't know. It gives me the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> That's it's interesting. Um, yeah, the the encounter suits are ones that I see you discard, and rightly so uh, after having seen you play this deck. Uh, just kind of knowing the value of a, of a leaner board. Um, I mean, of course, if they've got a, a brand on the other side of the table. That brand loves wearing an encounter suit. You know? I have played encounter suits on opponents' creatures a few times. Totally, totally, yeah. Get a, I get a chuckle usually when I do that. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. It's it's a fun one, and you know, not something that folks will will think to do very often. But yeah, I like it. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, and it's got hard R. So, and it's got hard R. Yeah. And I mean, you might have enough C for all the tokens running around quick draw. I'm not sure if uh... that was the reason I, I purchased this deck was winds of exchange. It was like a direct, it was probably in January, I think it was of this year. And I was like, I don't want to deal with these tokens. Let's find a, a deck that has a ton of C in multiple houses. And um, it's, it's pretty good. I think it's worked out as I hoped it would. Hmm.
Yeah, it looks like a very much a well killer deck. That was the plan, yeah. But still, like, I still don't, I don't know, like, I don't know. Uh, I think you're helping me kind of, like, see the light a little bit more and stick with this, even though I I was 5-2 and two, um, in Philly with it. I've really struggled with it in NKFL lately. And that's kind of, like, another reason where I'm kind of like, ugh, do I really want to, like, play this again at a vault after having kind of a bad spell? But, you know, it's small sample size, right? Like... I shouldn't let, you know, a small league like NKFL where I, you only play like six games with it decide whether or not you're going to play that at a vault tour. That's just too small of a sample size. Yeah, and NKFL is that's a very... something I think that's another. Oh, go ahead, Justin. No, no, no. Go, go for it. Go for it. Yeah. I was going to say that's something I think is another important point: is not overreacting. Uh, I've definitely been known to overreact to, oh no, I lost three out of four with this deck on TCO. I better start looking for another deck at this point. Yeah. Uh, you really want to make sure that you know, you're know you not overreacting to what could just be bad luck or what could just be a string of bad matchups or um, you know, it just who knows what happened. But if your deck is generally consistently performing and then you hit a bad stretch, that doesn't mean that the deck's not good. That just means that you hit a bad stretch for whatever reason. Yeah. I had a friend who was preparing for a vault tour earlier this year, and he was testing some stuff out, and he was pretty decided on his deck. And the night before, he was just like, man, I've just like I've lost a ton of games to this today. And I was like, don't let that affect you. It's a great deck. You know it really well. You should stick with it. And so, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Like, don't overreact to something, especially like, in the days right before an event it's it's good to mm -hmm. pick a deck early get the reps that we talked about stick with it and uh you know you'll know you make the right choice you know when you make it and just i would just say stick with it and keep getting the practice in and don't be discouraged by some bad luck totally and to 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 vc do you say vc che or vc she uh it's a hard it's a hard k sound so it's vc k man you've been flip-flopping on this deck i i just i, just... I have never flip-flopped on that that is italian pronunciation i would not mess that one up i'm also pretty sure you said pompitis at some point which is which is hilarious that's that's english <laughs> i can mess up english all i want <laughs> fair enough but uh what was i going to say um i don't think N <laughs> nkfl should be uh weighing too I think you need to take nkfl with a grain of salt for archon deck selection and the reason being like you're playing vc like if I'm letting you play VC, it's probably because I have some counters for it. And what's more, you are probably putting VC in a position where it needs to do a lot of work for the lineup. You know what yeah. I mean? I mean That's totally true. Yeah. I, I used it as like my deck that I was like, I, I can rely on this and I should just play it regardless of matchup. And I think that kind of got me in trouble a few times. Yeah, I mean I looked at uh, I don't think I would bring it anymore, but uh uh, had a deck uh, that I was playing an awful lot at one point, Aslan, that is just a monster double brig deck, right? And if I ended up being able to play it, it's because my opponent didn't care about brig and it was probably bad. <laughs> and it was probably bad. But uh, so, so it was either getting banned or it was just facing with terrible matchups, you know? Um, and so it's, it's kind of ban rate was decent, but win rate was not great. Um, yeah, and I think you have to be kind of wary of some of those things when you're when you're kind of be wary of conflating NKFL performance with you know pure Archon performance, if you will. Yeah, I think there's something else going on there too, which is the fact that NKFL is a heavily European league, and oftentimes the European selection of decks is different from the selection of decks that you're going to see um, at a U.S. event. So the types of decks that you're that you should be prepared to face are different types of decks. Mm. Mm, that's interesting too. Interesting too. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be curious to get some some kind of regional meta breakdowns. Um, I hadn't really thought about it a whole a whole lot, but that would be that would be kind of fun to fun to dig into. Anyway, I think the biggest I think the biggest takeaway that I'd want people to have from this entire discussion is the idea that when you have a new set come out that new set is going to completely shake up the meta assuming that it's a strong set um, like winds of exchange certainly is that 
shaking up of the meta gives the opportunity for all sorts of things to sneak in there that might not necessarily have been competitive before. Um, I think it's telling that for as amazing a deck as Pink Jacket is, you don't see Z playing it these days because of the fact that Winds of Exchange kind of knocked it out of the meta. Hmm. So we had this really established meta for several years because of the hiatus and because of the fact that we hadn't received a new set and we had played all these online events and everyone knew what the strong decks that were out there were. And then we had a small shakeup based upon the fire sale. But for the most part, it was the same meta with the same sets on the same decks. And now suddenly we're seeing that meta completely shaken up. This is the time when you can go in there with a deck that maybe wouldn't have been competitive before. And it might be competitive for two reasons. Number one, because of the fact that it's a Winds of Exchange deck and uh, Winds of Exchange decks just do crazy things that uh, we haven't necessarily seen before. Or number two, because it's the type of deck that counters Winds of Exchange well, and Winds of Exchange is a huge part of the meta at this point. So sometimes you can sneak in there with an anti-meta deck um, that happens to play very well into Winds of Exchange. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you're making a nice endorsement for Trooper. <laughs> I was just thinking. I, I wouldn't was, go that far. I was just thinking that. Quick uh, <laughs> I'm I'm not even I'm not even kidding. Like probably my two best woe decks that I have are both trooper decks. Your your best woe deck might not only be a trooper deck, but is also sub seventy Saz, or at least was when we were when we were playing it a lot. I don't remember. Yeah, uh, what it, it was kind of... subs. It's in in current Saz, it's sub seventy, and I think future Saz, I think it's eighty. Future Saz, eight, so sub seventy to eighty. I wow. mean, Saz is catching up to Trooper. It's happening. We just need to accept this new reality. <laughs> we think he's like listeners. Quick draw is not joking. <laughs> he's not joking. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. It's it's uh, maybe I'll play it after this and against your your beloved scholar. Um, but um, I'm, I'm not joking. Like Trooper with the right synergy is highly underrated. And I am I would strongly consider a Trooper deck for the next major Archon tournament I go to. Okay. Because of Trooper. It's actually funny. Like I don't think this is very off topic. I, I opened this deck at a local probably two months ago. And I looked at the card list. And uh, all the cards in, in the deck were like amazing. I was like, damn, this looks like a, a great deck. And then I saw it was a Trooper. And my first reaction was like, oh, well... This deck would be great if it weren't Trooper. And then thankfully I played it a few times and I'm like, holy crap, this deck would suck if it didn't have a Trooper. And I'm not kidding. There's there's so much synergy with it. It is a big body that I think is just very underrated with the tokens. Um, and it has so much creature control like with the Trooper itself. But creature control that does not hit the Trooper, which is like it a lot of one-sided It would be better types. with a Bellator and Warrior, though? Um... No, it would not be. I'm not kidding. I love Bellator and Warrior. Um, not Tonight has a great Bellator and Warrior deck. Um, but no, it's the synergy with Exalting. It has two ep epic poems in it, which really like makes the deck go. It's like the consistency that you talked about, having a couple of them, so that if one's tokenized, you can still have the other one. Um, I don't think it has any Sandhoppers or anything like that. But um, my second Trooper deck that is also very good um has two sand hoppers and so two sand hoppers two epic poems like you're gonna find that and that kind of combo can really rush and i think that that's obviously what makes the deck great is that it can win games in seven turns with a ton of creature control ton of amber generation and not a ton of pips for an infernus to eat into that is one thing that has been very refreshing to me since Winds of Exchange hit the meta, is that Jock aside and its Infernuses, we're really seeing very few Infernuses at Voltors anymore, yeah. uh, at, which I think is just fantastic because I was over that card several years ago and it had been dominating the meta until Winds of Exchange finally hit. Yeah, I, I agree. And in fact, I almost played a Dark Tidings deck in Philadelphia for Archon, but I was afraid of Infernus. Turns out I like I don't think I saw a single Infernus outside of JT's deck. Um, Eaton's Jar also hurts it, and I didn't see an Eaton's Jar outside of JT's deck. I mean, there were a few of them out there. I think one made the top eight, but you know I was so afraid of these specific cards that influenced my my decision to play a deck or not play a deck in Archon, and um, you know I, I 
I kind of regret that. I kind of wish I'd have played it now. And I think my chance is gone because I think it is a little bit weaker against tokens now. Um, but at the time, it was uh, for various. Well, I don't want to get into it too much, but there were some rule changes that happened that that kind of hurt it. But at Philadelphia, I think the important thing is that you guys remember there was not a ton of woe being played there. It was still like players adjusting to what mm -hmm. they wanted to trust and, and believe in with like Worlds Collide and Mass Mutation. So the woe count was a lot lower in that first Vault Tour than it was in the more recent ones. And so now you have to assume you're going to face a ton of woe. But back then it was a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, to sort of wrap, wrap things up, I have one, one last kind of question and it's probably not gonna be one we have a, we have a hard answer for, um, but general thoughts in closing, um, for a lot of collections too, I think there's a, there's a breaking point between, uh, or a trade-off between a deck ceiling and a deck's consistency. Um, and I think I, I, don't, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on kind of how strong you want your consistent deck to be before before the the, the temptress of a you know very high ceiling pulls you pulls you in a different direction? Like uh, let's take the the Jenka deck without uh, without any archiving as an example, right? This is a deck with a very high ceiling, but maybe it doesn't have much much going for it unless that combo lines up. Versus your uh, just for generalizations, like your your mid mid to low seventies uh, mass mutation deck that's just kind of good stuff, um, moderate moderate good stuff, but doesn't really have any spikes in its in its game plan. I mean, is there is there kind of a is there kind of a, a tipping point in your mind where you're you're like, mm, I don't know if the consistent thing is really going to cut it. I need to I need to push for something that's going to just win and, and and hope that it happens. Yeah, I guess that um, for me, I'd like to see, I mean, obviously what you ideally want to see is both, right? You want to see some amount of consistency towards whatever your high roll is going to be. Um, so just to kind of give an example of that with Helium, the deck that obviously we kind of started this discussion with, um, Helium obviously looks to high roll off of the trainer scholars, but it does that relatively consistently. And if it couldn't do that relatively consistently, um, I don't think that I would be able to play the deck at a um, high level. It's one of the things that I've said, because people have brought me decks before and they said, hey, look at this deck. It has a legionary scholar in it and it's got these other really good cards. And when I look at the deck, I see there's only one legionary trainer in there. And I was like, I just don't think that's going to be consistent enough. I think that you mm -hmm. have to have at least two legionary trainers in order to really make a legionary scholar deck work. So I think that you have to have a deck that can push aggressively, that can do something that's really good, but it's got to be able to do it at least semi-consistently. Um, so I know it's kind of a cop-out answer because you were looking for one or the other, but I really think you do have to have a balance of the two of them. I think just having one or the other is not going to be good enough on its own. Yeah, and I think that's what makes it so hard to trust the deck. You know, like I I might have decks that are consistent, but they, they don't spike hard enough. And that's how I feel a lot of my decks are. Um, and so that's why I, I kind of struggle to, trust and have faith in something um to play an archon so yeah i mean I, I hear you um i think i'd probably personally lean towards the ceiling for myself and i'd, I'd like to try to get you know like in-game decisions to allow me to get there more regularly maybe that's holding the right card in the right matchup um even if you don't have archiving for your jenka something like that i, I think personally I, I would lean closer to ceiling Mm. is my answer <clears throat> interesting interesting i think there's a i don't know a universal imposter syndrome around via deck viability unless you've already won a couple of vault tours yep uh so you yep. know it doesn't go away no matter how many decks you've got <laughs> i i feel that um i don't know john if you don't want to say how many decks you have that's fine but i'm, I'm wondering in your collection how many or what percentage of decks 
do you think you could be like, yeah, I could bring that to play Archon and Voltor? Maybe half a dozen. Okay. Is that talking like less than 1%? Uh, well, that depends on how you define my particular collection. Because I think I said in one of the previous times I was on here, I thinned my collection pretty hard. Mm -hmm. So I've opened over 3,000 decks, but I only keep a little over 200 in my collection. Okay. So and I guess it's about 3% of my collection, but <laughs> less than 1% of what I've opened. So did you, of those, you know, what, 2,800 that you've gotten rid of, any any Vault Tour candidates in there? No. Um, if I'm getting rid of a deck, then I feel, then it's, has shown me that it's not quite um, at the level that I want it to be at um, for high level competitive play. If I think it has a shot at high level competitive play, I'm not getting rid of it. So what you're actually saying then is 0.2% um, of decks <laughs> you think are Archon tier. Well, and it's it's an interesting question too, right? Because let's talk about for a moment um, the deck I mentioned from my first Voltor experience, Duke H. Gaunt Vision. And that deck was a deck that at the time I considered to be Archon competitive. Obviously, it was Archon competitive. It came in second in a Voltor. But uh, these days, I would never try and play that deck. Um, I know that the meta has passed it by and it doesn't really win anymore. So certain decks may have been competitive at one point, but they're not competitive anymore. Um, I have one deck that uh, won the NKFL Coda Archon Championship. It's a very good deck, but it wouldn't be able to compete in the um, current meta. Mm -hmm. So so you're just putting more hard... value on like evaluating the meta and kind of attacking from different angles. Oh, uh, and you know, so, and decks age out of the meta. You know, mm -hmm. decks that were competitive sometimes aren't as competitive anymore. You know, I mentioned um, how I mentioned earlier how you don't really see Z playing Pink Jacket anymore, and that's a fantastic deck. Uh, we haven't really seen Galaxy show up at Vault Tours uh, recently, and that's an amazing deck. So, you know, there are these very strong decks out there that um, were competitive at one point, and maybe they still are. Who knows? But um, that are not getting played anymore because people have decided that they're not competitive. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, to be fair too, I think you uh, don't want to don't want to put words in your mouth, but I feel like you personally are also at a point where you've seen a lot of decks. You maybe have a, a taste for decks that you like, and you probably don't need the two hundred and first competitive candidate <laughs> necessarily and so that may that may weigh into your decision to let things go and i may look at that deck 201 and be like this is my jam like like i can ride this to victory sort of a thing yeah 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 that's possible yeah yeah I, did, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there because we've been talking about how more decks are archon competitive than we think and then you know you have a very i think selective taste of what you would want to play and so I think affinity comes into play here as well. Like affinity. you may only have six that you'd like to bring, but someone else may have, they might be able to look at a lot of your other decks and say like, yeah, I would, I would totally bring that. I think affinity comes into play. Oh, absolutely. Um, I'll give you a good example of that. Um, at the last vault tour, um, one of my decks that had been just sitting in my collection um, that I hadn't been playing, um, I sold it to one of my teammates and she played it at the vault tour. She really liked it. I, I never liked the deck, never enjoyed it. Um, and she really liked it, and she ended up getting matched up against Drazkor, who was on Ooze, and she beat him with that deck. And mm -hmm. it's something that I probably wouldn't have been able to do with that deck, but it really fit the style that she wanted to play, and it did not fit the style that I wanted to play. So yeah, absolutely, the whole affinity thing comes into it. Yeah, I mean, you look at you look at Rector like that probably would have been in a bulk bulk pile for a lot of people <laughs> you know a lot of a lot of big sellers would probably have let that go without without one play you know maybe one play but you know uh, a lot of folks would look at a 70 low 70 sas aoa and just be like okay like moving on to the next lottery ticket um mm -hmm. uh so i don't know there's there are gems there are gems in there for sure 
and uh, mm -hmm. and the reps are definitely rewarded as as in that case absolutely well all right folks uh i can already feel myself uh uh, hating the editing later because we're going long. So, <laughs> yeah, because of my internet connections tonight. Yeah, it's been it's been pretty stable, or at least uh, at least you've gone in and out in ways that haven't been uh, too too noticeable. So, works. <laughs> uh, any cl any closing thoughts before uh, before we hear from our sponsor? Mm, yeah, not for me. Just thank, closing... thanks to John. Yeah, yeah. I, just I guess my closing thanks. thought would would be just. Um, you know, give give Archon a chance. Um, don't just determine that you can't play it and there's no way you can be competitive. Um, actually take that chance and you may find that you have a lot of fun with it and that uh, you may have things that you think that are more competitive than you think they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right on. Love it. Right on, right on. Well, folks, uh, season two has a very special sponsor for this one. Actually, this is one sponsored by by uh, by me, by JT Russell. I have a spinoff business where I'm doing um, uh, uh, pun books from the Crucible. Uh, so pick up your copy of Knox uh, Knox Knox Jokes over at Amazon. Uh, just search for Knox Knox over on Amazon. You'll find it there, uh, and you'll be ready for the next time you head down to your local. Uh, local event to uh regale your uh your your friends and locals with uh excellent excellent puns excellent puns so check it out check it out uh yeah proceeds go to supporting this very show right on so <laughs> uh yeah okay that one was kind of weak guys i apologize but you know <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in my opinion, I had some affinity for that one. I think that was an Archon caliber advertisement. Oh, right okay, okay. <laughs> oh man. Well, yeah. Waste. Ah, okay. Anyway, I, I had something brewing, but I don't want to make you all sit here while I pull it together. So we'll give Quick Draw the last word on that one. <laughs> Fix it in post. Fix it in post. We'll waste not the opportunity. Um, and uh, folks, I want to let you all know that. We record episodes of Bottom of the Beaker right here at twitch.tv slash sloppy lab work uh, every Tuesday night at 9.30 Eastern. Uh, you can find recordings of our past shows over at youtube.com. Search for at sloppy lab work over there. And for the very best content, 34, no, no, 57 times distilled and scraped from the Bottom Beaker. Search for that very phrase in your podcatcher of choice and we'll be there ready to test some of your Archon candidates with you. Thanks so much to Second Act, a.k.a. John from Weekend Key Warriors for uh, joining us for this very special second episode of Season 2, the 222. Thank you, John. Thank you guys for having me. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. And uh, quick draw, any word for the folks getting off of the final audio stop? Thanks to everyone tuning in live tonight. And everyone out there listening, stay sloppy. Stay sloppy indeed. Okay, cool. <clears throat> oh my gosh, there's actually a Knox book out there. How about that? Yeah, I was trying to, I was trying to like, oh, I could do something with Knox and Waste Knot. And uh, it, was, it wasn't coming together quickly enough. I, I caught the Waste Knot. I appreciated that. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I, I was like, I was like almost at a haiku, but I, 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 I don't know. It was going to fall on my face. But anyway, uh, should we should we head over to the TCO? You you buy, uh, both up for a game, uh, both up for a game. Sure, I'm up for a game. I, I feel think... like we have to play some kind of Archon, right? I think we do. Um, do we have to play? Do we also have to play something with troopers? <laughs> we don't have to. I mean, we have some options here. Um, we looked at some good decks tonight. We didn't look at the troopers decks, so we didn't look at the troopers decks. Uh, Winkler. I wonder if Winkler is even going to show up in the first uh, page of results. No, here. because uh, it, the deck is unexpectedly fancy. I will say that. The deck you is... might find it to be unexpectedly fancy as well. Unexpectedly fancy. 63 it's coming in at currently. Okay, and then 72 in Future Zaz World. Oh, just the 72. Yeah, it's. Um, I thought it was higher than that. It, it plays like an 80, I tell you what. Um, I do have a... I'm halfway to my Trooper Hexad for NKFL okay. next season. I have three Trooper decks that I really enjoy. Two of them, I think, Archon, Archon tier. 
this being one of them. Um, this is the one that I opened at my local that I said, dang, this would be really good if it didn't have Trooper. And then I played it and kind of flipped my thinking. Um, but uh, very cool rush deck. Um, I would be willing to pit this up against John's Archon deck if he wants to do so. If he's not afraid of being embarrassed by Troopers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say the what worries me more than the troopers is just the huge amount of C, but <laughs> um, it's sure, all part if you of it. Play it. We'll play but, yeah. it. Do you want to play a uh, hand and brain then, JT? Why don't you play the hand here? All right, sounds and good. I'll, I'll act as the brain for you. I want Team Trooper. Oh man, it mess with my stats. <laughs> you are you are in it. You are on sloppy lab work. You are on Team Trooper. It's just comes with the territory all right. you love discarding cards and you love troopers those are like the two i don't have a choice primary <laughs> characteristics well i can definitely get on board with um with talent scout and pull up stakes how about that <laughs> yeah yes it's uh it is certainly pretty powerful there cool all right i the have originator has a twin of this one Ooh, oh nice. sir basilisk winkler okay Oh, speaking of twin, I don't know if anybody has done this here yet, um, but I opened one of the duplicate decks. You know, that's kind of uh, the cool mm -hmm. thing. The cool thing to do right now: you open a deck that's already been scanned, and I sent it in yeah. to get to get a twin of back, and I'm very excited to have a twin of deck. I don't know. I think that's going to be super cool. Yeah, I actually I, I opened... submitted one. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say I submitted one of those weeks ago, and I haven't heard anything. <laughs> Are you going for the twin of as well? I don't know. I don't know what they haven't offered me anything yet. Oh, really? Okay. They did. I they took a while to get back to me. I actually opened two decks back to back that were already registered, and I messaged them through their website. Took about three or four weeks before I got a response, and they offered me the twin of, but they also offered a replacement deck instead. And I was actually not really keen on the decks themselves, so I just sent them in today to get replacement decks. So going to take those two lottery tickets hopefully in the next month or so okay yeah hopefully you get something <clears throat> they yeah they breathe a sigh of relief when you're like it's like please don't make us make a twin of deck that's got to be more i mean yeah. that's obviously more overhead on their end than uh i would imagine gotta be yeah than just shipping you a seal jeremy should back. be like this deck is 58 saz why do you want the twin of this deck <laughs> <laughs> no my, mine's interesting i i don't want to i don't want to say what it was because i don't want to sp spill somebody else's secrets but um mm. i you got a spicy one well i i didn't think it was particularly spicy but i got in contact with the person who opened the tw the twin the other twin and they're like oh yeah we're we're using this for an upcoming event big event uh mm -hmm. so um for alliance actually for alliance uh ah okay yeah but so i mean the deck is cool the deck is cool it's got some interesting pods in it so i don't know I don't know, but it's cool. Though. All right. Mm -hmm. so who's making the game here? Yeah, who's making the game? Are we <clears> playing <throat> Keyforge tonight, JT, or what? I'll make the game. Sloppy is the password. Make sure that hands are open. It's going to be in beginner. Excellent. And we'll I will not look at your hands. Put Winkler. Unexpectedly fancy. All right. <clears throat> Yeah. How many times have you seen this deck played, Justin? I've probably faced Winkler. I can. Oh, seen it played is a good question. Uh, I can tell you how many times I've played against it. Uh, yeah. Um, we've got the double Dino, double Spartasaur matchup here. This be a good one. This be a very good one. Indeed. Okay, I don't have that many that many games against it in my sheet, but I usually don't track all the the training games, as it were. Okay, mm -hmm. good luck, have fun. Good luck, have fun. Yeah, this might be a as well. hard matchup. Um, We'd expect nothing else. And then the brain will choose the uh, the mulligan or not? Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. All right, I I think I will keep this. This is gonna be a Great uh, Equidon first turn. All right, we'll go unfathomable. 
Okay. I mean, I'm playing this frigorific, ro frigorific rod with double pips, Camelani, and also sending back the netcaster with this dragnet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to play some Mars here. I'm going to stick Ironics Propaganda on your guy. Uh oh. I'm no duders. To, to destroy them all, uh -huh. to blow up everything. And Love it. And well, ammonia clouds your guys. Love it. Cool, cool, cool. All right. This is where it gets a little tougher. Mm hmm. This is a tough one indeed. Let's go with. Um. Hmm. Dang that. That unfathomable in helium is giving me some pause here. It's good, sweet of unfathomable. It really is. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Um. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go Equidon. I'm gonna take a take a risk here. Sorry, you said Equidon. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna discard forced retirement, and I'm gonna pass the turn and pass the turn. Okay, we're gonna go Saurian. We're gonna play out a Legionary Trainer. Get a Scholar off of that. We're gonna get another Scholar. We're going to reap those two scholars, play out Ballastego, and play out Spartasaur, sticking the amber onto Ballastego. Cool, cool. All right. Uh, worked out. I feel pretty lucky. And let's go with Saurian. Saurian it is. All right, let's think on this a little bit. Troopers are dinosaurs. Cool. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Yeah. Spartasaur does not trigger them. <laughs> uh, Cloggin is saying in the chat, you know what you have to do. <clears throat> Clearly, I'm fighting with these troopers. <laughs> I just might. I just might uh, fight with one of them. Uh, not, not this time, not this time. Maybe. <laughs> Might is what we need. Okay, maybe I will, maybe I will. It would be funny. <sighs> yeah, I am gonna fight with one, actually. Let's fight into the Spartasaur. I should have not done that first, but being sloppy. Yeah, real sloppy. Did I disconnect? Uh, I can Were still you hear thinking? you. Just thinking, although you oh. may have disconnected. No, you disconnected. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's so, like the oh. drama of what was happening. Yeah, I left like, a little value on the table time. there. Womp womp. Uh, okay, yeah, you definitely could have cleared his board. What? Killed um, the Ballastego. You and the... should not have. You should not have fought the Spartasaur. You should have fought the Ballastego. I was I was thinking fight the Ballastego, but then you leave the Spartasaur. You're not killing the Spartasaur and the Ballastego. You, you kill it with the Beware the Ides after you play. After, oh yeah, the yeah. Crushing charge. Gotcha, gotcha. Yep, yep. True, true. Okay, well, we're going to go unfathomable here. Mm hmm. Good call. Oh, that's a great abyssal site. Right. Yeah. Ooh, I don't love any of those options. 
A lot of good cards there. <laughs> yep. Got to get rid of that. Yep. Mm-hmm. And Fugru. Nice. All right. So we avoided the befuddle, which is good. Yeah. Sometimes the cards don't come out, and the cards are not coming out this game. All right. Mm. JT, this is my deck. I am the brain. You're going to forge the yellow key. It pains me, but as you say. Yellow key is always the correct um, one to forge first. Oh, my That's goodness. Right. JT, have you ever lost a game when you forge the yellow key? Have you ever lost a game when you forge the red key? Sure. Absolutely oh, have. You do it second? Yeah. yeah. I sometimes do it second. But <laughs> my point is, you've never lost a game forging the yellow key. So that's, I made the correct true. decision. That's true. Um, mm. Let's see here. This is... Uh, All right, let's let's go Saurian. I think we can do this. All right, Saurian. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sparasaur is coming over here on the left. Yeah, giving you two, capture two, gonna reap once, four, five, would still just give you two. Okay. Okay. Hmm. No? Uh, it's okay. Um, I would have fought with a trooper. Fought with the trooper into the Fuguru? Uh, no, into the Ballastego. Into the Ballastego. Interesting. Because you'd kill his whole board. Obviously, you'd want to play the patronage before you fought, if you did that. But uh, um, With the trooper I, and the Spar Sword, think, yeah, yeah. I think it's okay what you did. I think it, you still got good value, and you kept your board. You just didn't You just didn't wipe him. And the Fuguru is hurting you a little bit. Fuguru is hurting a little bit. I'm not that worried about the Fuguru, but we'll see, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, this draw is not good. Rut row. Yeah. There's not a lot I can do here. I needed for that um, first trainer to actually draw a Saurian card, which it didn't do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think if you had a Befuddle last turn, too, with the Abyssal Sight, you know, being able to see the whole hand and then choosing could have been pretty, pretty devastating. Yeah, it would have been brutal. Ooh, so we scooped up Fuguru and Spartasaur. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Mm, all right. This is interesting. Um. Hmm. Let's go with uh let's go with unfathomable. With unfathomable, huh? Okay, so we've still not seen any befuddles. We have two ammonia clouds coming and a brain dart at some point. Okay. Unfathomable it is. All right, so we're going to say that the Hema does not ready, and we're going to befuddle you into Mars. Looks good to me. Yeah, I think there's a good case for the under pressure going on Ballastego instead, too. Yeah, uh, I, I don't think there's anything I can do here. Yeah, the disruption 
when it hits i mean both of these decks just have nothing disruption. yeah when nothing is working there's not much you can do unfortunately um. Oh, discards it. Okay. We are in business well, I'm not now. Play it. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. That's a tough one to play. Uh, oh, you forged the red key. Oh, sorry. You're supposed to forge blue. Sorry. I'm, I, uh... Come on, man. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go back into the dinos here. Dinos it is. Okay. All right. So we're paling away the three. We're making ourselves a Selves a plebeian. Yeah. That's game. The game. Ooh, yeah. This deck has troopers. zero error control for a reason. Yeah. Yep. It's not the troopers. That's... It's the. It's oh, just it... the draw. It was I mean, the it troopers. Is what it is, but... I'm sorry to tell you, it was the troopers. What's... Oh, um. Quick draw. Loves his cute. Loves his troopers. Loves his troopers. Rematch. I... Yeah. Yeah. Let's try a rematch. <laughs> All, All right. right, let's do it. Let's do it. Do you, uh, am I, am I going to be the brain again here? We can switch it up. We can switch. Be I think off. it's okay. I mean. All right, I have, to, I have to redeem myself from the uh, the turn where I didn't wipe the board. All right. All right, quick draw. What are we doing? Keep or mulligan? I got to get back into the game. Oh, did it kick you? The old, uh, the it old did. rematch bug. Yeah, so... It says you um, I am now, yeah. Okay. I think... Oh, we're going second again. It's hard to throw this one back. It's... It's not, it's not bad. So, I think I'll keep it. Okay, we're keeping. And we're playing... Or we can only play cards from Equidon, okay? Yeah. Um, let's go Equidon. Okay. I mean, you've got so many befuddles, you can you can afford to play a turn one befuddle and hope to get a little lucky, I think. I think we discard this market crash. Uh, Quick draw can tell me yeah. if I'm if I'm mistaken there. No. Nope. <clears throat> totally agree. Yep. Okay, our general gets brain darted and then scooped up. Mm -hmm. Rude. All right. Memrox comes down. Very cool. Okay. Yeah, that's a pretty good turn. Um, let's go unfathomable. Okay, unfathomable it is. All right, so we'll play this rod with two pips. Uh, we've got a Kamalani. We are going to throw the Kamalani into an Abyssal Sight. Ah, damage pip. That was a misclick. Ah, damage. Misclick. All right, so what are we seeing uh, here? We got... I, yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll... I'm going to look at the hand, too, actually. But... I'll, I'll narrow it here. So we've got a Dragnet, Pale into Insignificance, Failing Strike, Befuddle, Longasaur Elector, and Azure Basin Outpost. Okay. Mm. Interesting, interesting. I think I'm actually gonna take the dragnet here, um, though there's some juicy stuff elsewise. Failing strife is interesting. I'm not that worried about the pale. I think we'll. Mm, befuddle basin is kind of annoying, but okay. Yeah, taking the dragnet. Quick draw can tell me if we do something differently there. And I'm going to use the ornate talking tray to make ourselves a trooper. Mm. I would have taken that befuddle for sure. Taking the befuddle? Yeah. Well, maybe. Okay, so we can only play unfathomable here. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what your tokens are. I mean, maybe it was okay. Um, ensuring that you survive um, as far as creature control over there the 
Basin would hurt a little bit if they go back into Unfathomable. Um, not know, two. Yeah, if there's two ammonia clouds. All right. Let's um, let's just go Unfathomable. I think. Okay. All right. Planus Vice Aloha. Do they go back into unfathomable? Unlikely. All right, we're going to use the uh, Azure Basin, or rather the Frigorific Rod. I mean, Memorox doesn't do better than Reaping right now. I don't see much more archiving out of Mars right away. I guess I'm not that worried about it, but probably going back into Mars or into Mars here. Uh, yeah, let's, let's knock down Memrox. Okay, I think you did disconnect. Oh, you got back in. Yeah, man, I'm good. It was just, uh, moving pretty slow. Yeah. Although Second I'm, act forges the correct key. Somewhat, yeah, somewhat regretting, kind of the chat saying, somewhat regretting playing Faisaloha with uh, Zyzox down there. So we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, I've uh, I've definitely gotten into trouble with the Faisaloa playing mm. it before. Um, yeah, I, I could see that. Um, no, not an issue. Non-issue. A non-issue, as it were. Uh, yeah, that works out pretty well, I'd say. Um, uh, all right, let's go with... Ooh, ooh, do I get greedy? Usually. Uh, <laughs> mm, not quite. Not quite enough. Let's go uh, Saurian. Okay. Saurian it is. <laughs> hmm. All right. We're... Trading one? Do we want to trade one? Reap, reap. Yeah, let's trade one here. Reap, reap. We're going to make a token with Phalanx Leader. <clears throat> reap with this Duder. And uh, also this one, sure. Burst there, and sadly, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna hold that one for now. We'll see if Quick Draw likes that or not. I think it's decent. It's a decent hold. Failing strike. Okay. Picking up some some of our monies. Solid. Ah, oh, that's a very good pale. Yeah. Okay. Cool. 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 Yeah. All right. So. You have choice of key here too. Quick draw. I won't. I won't take oh, it from you. Oh yeah. Um. Let's go yellow. Even. Yeah. Um. What do we got here? Um. This is a. More difficult one this turn, I'd say. Um, yeah, I think we're definitely going to have a differing opinion, however this one goes. I can feel it coming. Yeah, uh, it is it is a tough one. Uh, I'm going to say, um, I'm going to say unfathomable. 
The only the only place we would have differ is I would have snap said unfathomable. Um, okay. Wow. Interesting. Okay, so Faisaloha draws us a card. Um, playing this befuddle, and we're going to say, we're actually going to say you can only play Sorian uh, this turn. And we're going to exhaust the Scholar. Okay. <clears throat> Dislike? I think, I think I might have chosen Mars. I feel like the Mars over there, yeah, that's that's exactly what I was afraid of, was having a Legionary Trainer. Yeah, I mean, I let's see, let's see. Ooh, getting scary. Ooh, Spartasaur comes down with a capture pip. Cool, takes us off check. That's a big. That's a big stop. Very nice. Maybe a little greedy. Perhaps a little greedy. Mm -hmm. And you did disconnect quick draw. Yep, just having some real internet issues tonight. All right, um, well, we are pretty clearly going Equidon here. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a big one. Yeah, let's see what we can do here. Sequencing, always important. No, YOLO. Interesting. Let's have a look at this hand. So the hand is uh, Lack Kaboom. Okay, yeah, I see it. It's Mes not bad. Mesmerist, Iron X Propaganda, Fuguru. Another Iron X Propaganda, Hema, and Netcaster. Okay, cool. So our second take. Okay, I think I'm actually going to take the covetous Hema here. Anticipating shuffling it away just to get it out of play. Um, let's see if we if we regret that. Uh, so now we pull up stakes, shuffle back in the Hema, send back the Scout, Lector, Legionary Trainer. Hmm. Maybe I needed that Hema. Should have thought this through better. Womp, womp, womp. <laughs> no, I, I think, I don't know. It's, um, it, yeah, it's a tough call. I mean, maybe I did like discarding it, but no, I'll let you, I'll let you finish out the turn. I think yeah, yeah. it's a tough call. So I will yell that. I almost, I feel like I have to take this legionary trainer, unfortunately, though. It is kind of the trick. I would really like to not go for the legionary trainer. Mm. Spartasaur is very tempting though. It's a nice capture pip, but okay. Anyway, I think I'm taking the legionary trainer uh, on the next pass. So we'll do that. Um, it does have a nice damage pip too, which is clutch. Um, so this one will come down. We're gonna take this legionary trainer, damage a scholar left here. Yeah. General Zorha comes down, damages the Scholar. That's gonna unfortunately not give us the play effect. Mm. Yeah, we have to do that though, unfortunately. Okay. 
and then uh, we play the shrewd investor capture and auction off our rod okay snap back into Sorian mm-hmm. yeah yep two from there pretty good I don't know yeah I think maybe saving I don't know you couldn't you couldn't afford to save the covetous Hema. it was either the well because you needed to needed to take the lecture the, the trainer the trainer yeah, yeah you needed to take either the trainer or the spartosaur i think yeah yeah that was that was, that was an interesting one i don't know if there was a, a way to leave myself in a better position here um ooh symposium nice yep that'll yeah do it that's pretty good and another trainer <laughs> it must have been one of the scholars that was bounced back. Is that right? No, it just drew into on the um, oh. the scholar <laughs> draw. Nice, nice, nice. Solid, um, solid. Well, two rush decks um, going at it. So let's just go back to Sorry in here. Okay. Oh, you get to, you get to forge your key. Yeah, there you go. I'll let you forge the red one. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Sorian. Okay, we can boil the eyes. Pale takes those out. So Pale first. Take that one too. Mm. Crushing charge. We're maximizing for fun here. All right, let's see. Quick draw can uh, can. Uh, can coach me on this turn afterwards. I think I disconnected again. Yeah, I don't think I can do better with crushing charge first, then pale first, and then the only difference being that we're gonna kill the trainer this way too, both trainers. Mm. So that leaves those two. So I either leave Spartasaur and Trainer or Spartasaur and Lector while hitting my own Trainer. Hmm. Okay, well, uh, first we'll make a token dude. Comes in ready. Reap here. Yeah. Could have done the damage there. That's okay. I guess I would get a little bit more. Um, but oof. Okay. Good game. Well played. Good game. Well yeah, played. Again, you could have cleared his board. Could have cleared his board. It didn't. It didn't matter. But yeah, you could have cleared his board. Tell me how I could have cleared his board. You just fight the Spartosaur with the okay. trooper with fights, and yeah. then and then use. Uh, um, well, I would have used. You should have used Pale first, mm -hmm. so you get the pip out of it, and you fight the Spartasaur to kill your first trooper, and then you can beware the Ides on the Lecter. Yes, but. yeah, yeah. With fights, with fights, I could. With fights, I could have. I was, yeah. I was full, full reaping with those guys, but I would have gotten more pip plays too, for sure. Well, these are fast games, so I feel like we might as well just play the third. Play third. I don't know about you. Oh, oh, snap! You got time for one more? <laughs> oh, sure. with fights. <laughs> oh, with fights. Yeah, clog it. I know. I should be thinking fight first. All fight right. first, ask questions later. All right. Good luck. All right. I'm in it. I'm in it this time. And we're going to go first. Okay. All right. Are we keeping uh, Hmm. Hmm. I kind of like it. I think I'm gonna keep it. Okay. Cool. Uh, we'll go Equidon. All right. I'm gonna play this visible hand and show you what I got. Two troopers is what I got. That's it. Just two troopers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, sunk cost from John. That makes this a higher probability play. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it, it's our skill game. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. That works too. <laughs> nice. All right. Uh, well, um, I'll at least give you an option, and we can go Saurian. Okay, Saurian it is. Hmm. Going with a couple of reaps here. I mean, I really do like Symposium. I really do like Failing Sleeter. I think I'm going to pitch him, though. You can tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong. I would have, I would have kept the Symposium. Kept the Symposium? All. Interesting. Yeah. Mm. Um, it really enables the epic poem, and in a rush game like this, I think I would have, I would have held on to that one. Okay. Yeah, interesting. I I actually ditched the symposium, thinking that on balance I was getting to the epic poems more quickly. Um, but interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's go. Unfathomable. Okay, unfathomable it is. I think that was inevitable. Yeah. So we'll play yeah. the befuddle into Mars once more. Um, Kamalani is going to come down, and I think it's also going to wear the under pressure. Yep. I think that's what I would have done too. Why did you discard the two creatures? Rather than kill them with the... I had reasons. Uh -huh. He's got reasons. All right. Yeah, the Memrox would have lived is interesting. Okay, Kamalani gets scooped up. Nice. All right. Um, cool. Interesting. Uh, interesting indeed. Let's go with. I think let's go Sarian. Okay. Going Saurian. Making a plebe. And a Pride Armarius. And throwing some more amber on our dudes. Okay. It's the name of the game. Mm -hmm. This is why. Here comes the dudes. Oh, yep. Ah, uh, very nice. The pale. Yeah. Mm hmm so I was trying to play around another befuddle by going into Saurian there. Um because I feel like if we had gone Equidon, it would have been pretty easy to not draw any more Equidon and then just get the Fuddle in Equidon and have a, a worthless turn. So I thought we could get some value out of that Saurian turn. Mm -hmm. And then if they go Befuddle the next turn after that, then we at least have some options. Mm. The Memrox would still be a safe play, I think. Uh, oh, Symposium, nice. <clears throat> oh dear. Yeah, that's trouble. That's trouble. And a recruit. Yowza. Yeah, two rush decks. It's hard to hard to come back from fourteen there. Fourteen's gonna be tough. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's do uh Equidon. Oh forge we'll forge the uh the red key. Okay, red key it is. I'm gonna try not to hurt your win percentage when you forge the yellow. <laughs> Much appreciated. Uh, I think we are playing this market crash. Yeah. No big surprise. Yeah. We will zap the scholar. I think we're actually going to auction off our exoshell system. Do we care to force retire one of these dudes? I think so. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking um, you could force retire the ward so they wouldn't gain one. But you pop the ward. Ah, that's actually a good point. Destroy creature if you do. Right, right on. Might have been, might have been the play. Might have been the play. Yeah, yeah. I like it. 
Abyssal Sight is going to hit us. Mm. Those, those Abyssal Sights, they hurt. They, uh, you can feel them. Oh, yeah. They're good. <laughs> it gets me every time. It gets me every time, Earth. I don't know. Every time. Yeah, that was a mistake, though. What was? I, changed, I messed up my ordering there. Hmm. Uh, oh, because you didn't. Oh, you did. You had to destroy the Gaboon. Is that what you wanted to do? No, you'll see in a moment hmm. how I messed up the ordering. Uh, let's see. I don't care that much about that. Now we may have a, a sunk cost coming. Do we see sunk cost uh, already? Yeah, we did. No, it's because I should have done that first. Dragnet. Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you should have. Um, Interesting. That's a doozy right there. Okay. Um, let's go unfathomable. Okay. Unfathomable it is. Netcaster comes down. Abyssal Sight pops the ward. Mm. Smashes the Netcaster. Interesting. Ooh, it's, that's uh, so close. Um. Hmm. We've got double Ironix propaganda, longsword lector, ammonia clouds, weaponsmith. Hmm. Ugh, I think I'm gonna take the weaponsmith. Actually, um, ugh, maybe. Am I? My thinking is then they're gonna have nothing to do with Mars. They'll take it. I guess. I guess John will happily take a Saurian turn. But as the Mars turn is just gonna be too good for us to come back from if they if they get it now. Yeah, I think I have to take the weaponsmith. Um, and hope that we don't give them a Mars creature here. I don't want the chains, but maybe that was a better play too. We'll see. We'll see. Um, so the only thing you kind of messed up the ordering there too is that you could have mm. dragnet at the ward. Dragnet first. And then you mm -hmm. Same fight. exact mistake. Yeah. 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 I did like the weaponsmith. That was that was the choice I would have made too. Um, <laughs> taking away the bigger turn, giving yourself some outs here at least. Yeah, that was a. Uh... That was a bummer on the... Yeah, I should have it first. Dang. Sloppy. Sloppy indeed. All right. Uh, we'll go... Um, blue key. Okay. Oop. And... Equidon. All right. Let's see what we get here. Two dudes... And some capture? No. Rampaging brooded on. Oof. <laughs> okay, well. Oh, interesting. I can uh, destroy the. No. Oop. Good game. Well played. Good game. There's the good cards in your hand now. There um, they are. Oh, yeah. No, no epic poems until now. Interesting. No. Yeah. Do we see one? No, we hadn't seen uh, either. I don't. Wow. I don't think we did. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. Well, well, well played, John. Yeah. A couple of stuff for me there as well. Mm -hmm. I think it just shows you the importance of draw. <laughs> draw is big. Happen. You need to, yeah, two rush decks like this, you know, like. Yeah. The pressure is. The ones that went ahead early, yeah. Yeah, the pressure is real. Getting ahead early is a big boon. I mean, uh, yeah, there was some, there was some sequencing sequencing things in there that were i don't know if they ended up being meaningful a little bit um but could have been could have been really impactful yeah yeah i was uh i totally missed i totally missed the the dragnet first then abyssal sight second to kill the thing but uh, and was sweating the whole time well, the that funny I was thing is you send back a the Mars funny creature. thing is you missed it the turn after i missed it yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> womp 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 womp. Yeah. yeah, pretty close games though. Um, 
What, what do yeah. you guys call that? Um, million dollar plan, five dollar mistake, or something like that? Yeah, billion the dollar plan, billion five dollar blunder. Five dollar blunder. That's mm-hmm. right. Five dollar blunder. Mm-hmm. Right. Or on Archon's corner, it's why I suck at Keyforge. I got lots of those too. I got lots of those too. <laughs> <laughs> So I think, I, I don't remember how many turns the first game was, but the last two games were seven turns. Yeah, it feels it feels kind of like that seven turn mark is kind of the fundamental turn for for Rush right now. Um, like I think so too. Like just, just all out pressure wants to be forging that, threatening for that third key around turn seven. Mm-hmm. Yep. yep. Yeah, well, um, thanks for staying on late, John. Appreciate it. Good games. <laughs> yeah um i appreciate you guys having me on and uh, it was a lot of fun and um yeah let's hope that uh in the next round that ghost galaxy gives both you and me some preview cards <laughs> <laughs> let's uh let's not hold our breath i don't know that'd be fun though we're, t- <laughs> we're too sloppy for such treatment <laughs> we'll <Yeah>. see <laughs> but hey thanks, thanks for, for watching everybody thanks for being in the chat folks catch y'all later Bye, y'all.